Welcome to the Floods Management webinar. Dear viewers, we are glad that you took time to join us today. This webinar is being recorded. You're welcome to submit your questions using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. The Q&A session will take place at the end of this session. We have disabled the audio and video sharing uh, and chat. I like now to hand over to the director of Columbia Global Centers, Nairobi, Dr. Murugi Tirango. Thank you, Pauline. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to our global audience and welcome. As Pauline has said, I am Murugi Dirango, director of Columbia Global Center, Nairobi, one of nine centers across the globe established by Columbia University, New York, to conduct uh, to connect the local with the global, to create opportunities for shared learning, and to deepen the nature of global dialogue. Today, we are delighted to host a distinguished panel in collaboration with Columbia Global Centers, Mumbai, and the University of Nairobi on floods management, prevention, protection, and mitigation. Year in, year out, Tens of thousands of people are displaced from their homes and businesses due to flooding. Lives have been lost, homes swept uh, by mudslides. There has been an uh, increase in waterborne diseases and destruction of crops and property. All these effects have had serious economic and social consequences. Our panel of experts from Kenya, India, and the United States will provide insight into how we can mitigate prevent and ultimately protect city, uh, civilians from floods and their aftermath. I would now like to introduce our moderator, Odiambo Orodi from the Department of Environmental Biosystems Engineering, University of Nairobi, to introduce our speakers. Welcome, Mr. Orodi. Uh, thank you very much, um, Rugi. And uh, thank you very much for our participants for this occasion us. Today we have a team of five flood, flood mitigation and management. And in this team we have a manager of the water program at the Center of Science and Environment in New Delhi. She is a geologist by profession and also will be covering issues of policy and training and issues of water and sanitation, which are her major areas of expertise. Then we have Professor John Mutter, who is a professor of earth and environment sciences at the Columbia University. We have Dr. John Paul Obiero, who is a hydrological expert from the Department of Environmental and Biosystems Engineering of the University of Nairobi. Then you have Dr. Beth Tellman, who is a human uh, environmental geographer at Columbia University. And we also have the Chief Executive Officer, Ms. Uh, uh, Agnes Bugwa, who is the, the center uh, CEO of the Regional Center on Groundwater Resources, Education, Training, and Research of the Ministry of Water, Sanitation, and Irrigation in Kenya. So these are our key panelists. And therefore, to start us off, uh, we will ask our team to put up our program to start us off today. Thank you very much, and welcome, panelists. So to start us off on this process, we have the first presentation that is coming up. It's on flood prediction based on hydrological system modeling by Dr. J.P.O. Obiero, who's a senior lecturer at the University of Nairobi. Dr. Obiero, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, Will I be the one to share the slides? Oh, 
Oh yeah, thank you. I can now see my slides. I think we can move straight away to the second I slide. Request the slide to be put on. Because the first one just gives the topic. Yes, the slide is ready. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so I'll simply just quickly go through the, this topic of a flood uh, prediction based on hydrological modeling. Now, because of the period of time for presentation being short, my presentation is going to be a bit uh, narrow, focused, and uh, specific. Now, uh, there are various types of uh, floods or causes of floods, but my focus uh, in my presentation, I would like us to view that aspect of flooding which is associated with the increase in the water level, especially in the rivers, as a result of increased discharge that emanates from heavy rainfall and of course other uh, parameters. And of course this results in the overtopping of the river banks and then inundating the surrounding areas which usually are referred to as the floodplains. Now as has been pointed out, year in year out we keep experiencing floods and especially here in, in Kenya. And most of the time the actions to protect people against the flood has been crisis based in the sense that it involves emergency rescue operations, would relief, the settling people to higher grounds quickly and the like. Now one possible reason could be due to inability or failure to predict or forecast floods. Can move to the next slide. This is the next idea. Now, one way of forecasting or predicting floods is by use means of hydrological modeling. Now, without assuming that everyone is familiar with what a hydrological model is, I'll quickly, in a minute or so, just highlight it. Now, a model basically is a representation of a real system. And an example of such a system is the hydrologic system. A system, as you know, is simply a, a, a combination of a, it's a collection of components that interact in a certain manner as to produce an output. Now, in the case of a hydrological system, the components are the hydrological processes, which are uh, processes like infiltration, uh, percolation, uh, interception, and so on. Okay which interact in a certain manner as to yield the output, which is usually stream flow that is associated with floods. Now, uh, an example, a typical example of a hydrological system in the context of uh, hydrology is actually a watershed, right? So without spending too much time on that slide, I think we can move on to the next one which shows the watershed as hydrologic system. Okay. So just on the next slide, yes. So in the, in the watershed, we have a certain, the watershed has certain characteristics, in which are, these include things like soils, uh, land use, and things like that, topography which act upon rainfall, which is usually associated with flooding, and then brings, uh, yields actually the, the stream flow. It is the stream flow here, which is a function of time, and especially the peak, peak flows that actually cause flooding. Okay. So we can move on to the, the next uh, slide. Yes. Now, models require input data in order for them to, to simulate uh, stream flow, to set up and simulate stream flow. 
This partial data includes this, the, the digital elevation model, which basically is repeated topography, and then land is land cover, which I have mentioned, and the soils. And we also need ground data, which is a river discharge, observed river discharge, which is used in model calibration, and also rainfall and the temperature and other weather variables, which can be obtained from weather stations. Now, these data are useful in model setup, calibration, and validation, so that it can be used for predicting flows, and particularly peak flows, which are associated with flooding. And you can move on to the next slide. Okay. You can move on to the next slide. Now, the next slide actually explains the importance of uh, remote sensing and GIS, which are useful actually in modeling. Now, the remote sensing helps us to extract spatial data, actually, for us, which are used as input to the hydrologic models. Now, such data includes satellite images, which actually provide, uh, which can be processed to obtain land use information and also topographical information in the form of the BEM. We then use GIS as a platform for entering this spatial data and processing in a way that we can be able to simulate stream flow using the hydrologic models. And such flows are important actually in flood prediction. We can then move on to the next slide. Yeah. So the next slide, in the next slide, uh, we see now the role. Okay, this basically is just uh, an illustration of uh, an example of a model. That's the sort model which I have worked with for some time, and it simply shows us on the extreme left we have there the the kind of input data that we talked about. Then uh, next to it we have the preprocessing of the data, and then we have the element of calibration. On the, on the third column, but most importantly, you can look at the section on the output tables. Now that output tables will simply give us the flow, the flows at different times from where we can be able to pick out actually the peak flows that actually cause, cause flooding. Okay. So this information can of course be exported to Excel and then be analyzed for, for peak flow analysis. We can move on to the next slide. So having just given an overview of what a hydrological model is, now what relevance or use does it have actually in, uh, in flood management? Now, based on hydrological modeling, the peak flows, once identified, can be used actually in hazard in flood hazard mapping so that we can identify the areas that have been inundated or submerged in terms of the area of extent as well as the, the depth. Okay. And I've just came out, I came across very good literature by the authors indicated there showing how a hydrological modeling system can use remotely sensed data in carrying out an inundated analysis and then forecasting the depths and aerial extents of flood depending on their magnitudes. And this can actually be used in, in flood management and flood protection. Okay. So we can move on to the next slide. I'll finish with this. This is the HECLAS model, a logical model system. This basically just shows how you can use a logical modeling in mapping out areas that are flood prone. Now, these are just details of how the model is reported to be working. So, based on uh, stream flow modeling and uh, uh, determination of the peak flows that are associated with flooding, we can be able to do an analysis of the floods and obtain flood magnitudes with different uh, return periods. And for each one of them, we can be able to map out areas that are affected in terms of aerial extent and depth, okay? So one of the inputs I've talked about is the BEM is used in this particular model to generate uh, information uh, 
which include things like Steam Central Line, Main Channel, Banks, and Blue Parts, and then used actually for generating a profile analysis for mapping out areas that are affected by floods. So we can move on to the next one, slide. The next slide, please, yes. So now the problem of uh, every time there's flooding, we usually also associate it with the uh, climate change, okay, which compounds actually the, the problem of actually flood prediction. And also we have land use changes, which are associated actually with development. Now, climate change, I think there's a panel still going to talk about that. Usually it's associated with changes accidental and temperatures, which can be predicted uh, for the future. And this actually affects actually the flows. We also know that human activities associated with the development, for example, uh, in this urbanization, also affect add impervious services and they increase actually runoff. And therefore, the rivers are therefore not able to cope with the rains that fall uh, because of the increased moisture, which can be not contained within the, the river, the river channels. Okay. So, in short, what I'll say here is that we can use hydrologic models to, to couple the climate scenarios which are predicted by climate experts for the future into hydrologic models so that we can be able to predict the flow changes and therefore the nature of the floods will take in the in the future. Okay. So we can move Thank on you to very the much. next slide. Yes. Thank you very much. Yeah. The last one simply shows some of the research yeah, that have been conducted, yes. With regard to floods in Kenya, where I've been involved, yes. And uh, their role actually in flood management. The so first thank one you very much. Shows the Zoya River Basin is an area. Uh, okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. That's thank the last slide. Much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Biero. Uh, yes. So I think uh, that was great for us thank to get the sun. So we have gotten the science behind a flood and flood um, uh, management, flood prediction, and we want to integrate that together with an understanding of how science is used to do, to inform implementation. And to lead us through this process will be the experiences of Chennai, a city in India, as presented by Susmita Sengupta. So the next panelist is coming on to discuss something on urban floods, the case example of India. Madam Susmita Sengupta, welcome. Thank you. Can I please share my slides? Okay, hello everybody. I'm Sushmita from Center for Science and Environment. And today I'm going to talk about urban floods, a slightly different type of floods that we generally get for the other parts of the country apart from the urban areas. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So before starting, let's first understand what are the urban floods. As I was telling you, it's generally different from other type of floods that we get every time in our country. It is a hazard that is faced by generally cities and the towns. And there is a huge economic loss along with that, uh, because, uh, just like other types of floods. And also there are environmental impacts. Urban floods has a unique character of being very quick, very localized, as a result of uh, a very intense rainfall. We know due to climate change, there will be a variability in the rainfall. The rainfall will come in a very small spell of time, and it will be very intense. And urban flooding will 
because due to these type of rainfall events. And the biggest reason for this type of urban floods is actually losing our sponges in the city. That means the encroachment of the water bodies in the city. Next slide, please. Now let's uh, go deeper into why these type of floods occur. Now on the left hand side at the top, you can see one map, another map you can see at the bottom. The top map is a map from a northeastern part of the country, which is um, a small city called Guwahati in, North, in Assam, a northeastern state. There what happened is there were a series of water bodies connected to the main river known as the Brahmaputra River, which is marked in the map. Now what happened due to the encroachment, huge encroachment, huge mining activities and dumping of waste, all these water channels got cut off from the, from the main river and as a result, flash floods, the urban floods are happening due to intense rainfall. So we have built across all these water bodies and we have forgotten that what is the art of the drainage in the city. We only, we are looking at buildings and not on water. And if you see the map at the bottom, it is another uh, uh, small city in the northwestern part of the country. This is Udaipur. Here also, we had a unique system of water channels connected to water bodies, which got interrupted because there were encroachment and pollution, which clogged the water. So the main evil playing here is the encroachment due to rapid and unplanned urbanization. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay. So we have some uh, photographs where we see the uh, some pictures of urban flooding. And the main reason you can see on the right hand side, which shows that the encroachment of water bodies have happened, buildings have come up, even rail tracks have been for actually built on these water bodies. So unplanned, um, um, unplanned encroachment of water bodies, which have created such havoc, which you can see on the left hand side. Next slide, please. Now, we at Center for Science and Environment try to correlate what are the major flood events and the loss of water bodies in the major cities of India. You can see the blue dots, which are the major cities of India. The light blue dots actually give you the number of events, flood events, and the deep blue one around the light blue points, you will see the maximum loss of water bodies in these cities. And the red figures are giving you the uh, population which is in million. On the right hand side of the slide, you will see the, how the urbanization scenario of India will change in 2031. In 2011, it was 31% and it will almost become 50% in 2011. Let's first understand how these things are affecting the uh, flooding in the urban areas. Let's first take a city in southern part of the country, which is Chennai. Next slide, please. Now, Chennai had always had huge number of water bodies. But when in 1980, some assessment was done, it was seen that there were almost 600 water bodies, but in 2008, it almost, there was only a fraction of legs that was left in a healthy condition. Others were either polluted and clogged or they were completely uh, encroached. If you see the area that was occupied by the major lakes in the city, it had also come down to half. It, it, it was 1130 hectares in 1980, which has in 
2000, early 2000, come down to 645 hectares. That's why China is facing huge urban flood events almost every year during the monsoons where, you know, uh, where the urban areas totally get waterlogged and people face huge problems. Even the stormwater drains, which was supposed to carry the rainwater in a city, in any city, whenever it is planned, stormwater drains are also planned according to the rainfall intensities. But we see in Chennai, in 2847 urban length of the road, it is only 855 kilometers of stormwater drains that have actually been constructed. So stormwater drains also need to be designed, according, keeping in mind that there will be a variation in the rainfall and it has to be planned uh, very uniquely so that no polluted water enters into the stormwater drains and there is a free flow of rainwater. In it. Next slide. please. Now, what are the actually the problems? The problem lies because there is no coordinated actions happening between different departments. Like lakes, the water bodies are under certain department and the catchment, because most of our water, lakes and water bodies in our country are rainwater lakes. As a result, the water is flowing from the catchment area. So we need to protect not only the lakes, but the catchments and also the conduits that are carrying the rainwater from the catchment into the lakes. So, but here what happens, sadly, the lakes and the catchments are under different agencies. As a result, there is a conflict of interest. The uh, agency who is controlling the catchment has different set of uh, uh, interest and they want to actually uh, protect it in a different way or use it in a different way and lakes and water bodies are under different agencies. As a result, the coordination is completely lacking between these agencies and they work in silos. And the process of restoration, if there is a restoration process planned for a lake, it always gets delayed because the coordination which is required between different agencies looking after the catchment, the water body, the conduits are completely different. And because the water bodies are drying up, it becomes, uh, uh, they are easily occupied by the real estate or the builders, or they are actually become, they become the spots for garbage dumping or anyone, anyone, whether poor or rich, everyone is actually after those dry water bodies. Thank Next you, Shishmita. Thank you very much, Shishmita. Thank you. Very okay. Much. okay. Okay. Yeah. The next slide is uh, the last one, which basically says thank yeah, you. Yeah, it's the last one. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Thank you very much for the presentation, and therefore we will pick from there. Having gotten the the example of what is happening in India, and we want to borrow up on that and bridge that with the experiences of what is emerging in Kenya especially from the planning perspective and this to lead us in this process will be madam agnes bugwa who is the ceo of our regional center for on groundwater resource education planning and research and she will give us the perspective from the policy view the planning view and what the center is positioning itself to accomplish and do. Madam Agnes, it's your turn. Thank you, Dr. Rodi. I take this opportunity. Do I, do I upload myself? Okay. It's already up? Yes. Yeah, I've just uh, changed today. There's some slides. So I'll check on that. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Rodi, for inviting me to this uh, webinar. Uh, we are talking about uh, flood management from the perspective of planning and also 
that is another one that has been put up. Uh, can I attach it from my end? Okay. So I'm hoping this is the, the light one that I have. So I'll be able to control. So we, um, I'm coming from the regional center on groundwater resources education, training and research. And uh, we are mandated to, as a, as a center that is taking care of the specific issues in groundwater assessment, groundwater management and development, and also the issues of governance and advising policy at, um, and partnering with the regional bodies. So I want now to bring in the perspective of uh, flood management protection and uh, prevention in the issue of groundwater. And I'll start with the issues of uh, urban planning and flood management. And I'll do a bit of introduction, management of uh, floods, key issues for consideration in flood management and the opportunities that we have in that. So the general introduction is that we all know that uh, climate change has been a global issue and also coupled with the urban, increasing urban uh, urbanization that is a huge challenge in managing the urban planning for sustainable future. So we also understand the drivers that has been uh, discussed earlier on that are behind the urban flooding and um, they have a devastating impact to human and society. Apart from climate change, we have the density uh, that is accruing from the residential areas, the infrastructure that is uh, wanting, and we have the, them as the main drivers that are, that are there. We also have the issue of the flood risk, urban flood risk uh, management that have to be controlled under that, these drivers. Then the casual factors, including the combination of uh, loss of pervious areas in the urbanizing landscape, inadequate drainage systems, blockages due to indiscrimination, disposal of solid waste, and building dead leaves, encroachment of storm water drainage, housing in flood plains, and natural uh, drainage and loss of natural floods, storage sites. So these are the major issues that are there. And uh, it continues to issues to do with the, the floods, management of floods that in urban flooding the consequence of increased impermeable catchment resulting in higher catchment uh, in a shorter duration and flood speed sometimes reaches up to three times so the issue of our flood management that results from the catchment it's very crucial because most of the institutions or so most of the towns are build on uh, flood plains, especially uh, example of Nairobi, it is built on a flood plain. So it suffers a lot of flood issues. So designing of efficient storm water drainage system needs uh, to be a, a priority so that um, the, 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 the responsible profession can do it. So we have the issue of uh, is it possible to produce? Madam Agnes, is yes. it possible for you to put slideshow so that it becomes bigger for people to see? Can you put it on slideshow mode? Yes, yes, there it is. Great, continue. Yeah, so uh, thank you. Uh, then we have uh, the, the drivers that we have yeah. put up there. And uh, 
these uh, that uh, from the control or no control, from no control to, to full control, the drivers that have been uh, need to be put in place so that the management of the floods can take place. So we have key issues for consideration in management of floods. That is the enabling uh, environments, that is the legal policy and institutional framework has to be in place. We have to incorporate the stakeholders so that they can support the integrated floods risk management. The data, we cannot overemphasize the importance of data and that is the reliable data. And uh, that is also a, a huge, it's a great challenge that we are experiencing here in Kenya uh, because the data is uh, disintegrated and it is, it is not having a centralized uh, institution. Then we have the issue of uh, flood modeling. Dr. Obiero has talked about it and the risk man mapping that is applicable and useful for both formal and informal context. We have another key issue that is uh, communal and infrastructural. Uh, there is the need of the social cohesion, especially in the formal context. The structural form of uh, mitigation that causes harm by constructing landscape and uh, and structures that includes the aquifer storage and recovery. So these are very crucial and uh, especially for us in the groundwater uh, sector, we are looking at uh, especially the issues of the systems in the aquifers, especially for the Nairobi aquifer. We have the other structures for flood water diversion and storage Floods, plains, and uh, stream restoration, low impact development, that is the green infrastructure. Uh, we have also the opportunities uh, in this uh, area of uh, flood management. And for us, as a, as a research center that is uh, uh, working at the, the issue of uh, groundwater, we are raising awareness of how we can manage these flood waters to do manage aquifer recharge. So this is our area of domain, and that's what we are doing, and we have started off. This is a new institution, and we have done uh, uh, our kickoff in this area of uh, manage aquifer recharge in the Nairobi aquifer, where we, we tend to source for water, especially for floods, uh, water control. And in this, uh, we intend to, uh, to do groundwater management and development. So in the capacity of doing managed aquifer recharge, we intend to increase the storage of uh, groundwater and make it available for the residents because uh, you realize that the waters that is utilized in Nairobi, it is from interbasin transfer. So the source is coming from a different uh, basin away from Nairobi. So um, it will also cause uh, the stability of the ground, thus prevention of that subsidence. And we realize because of the over abstraction of the groundwater in the Nairobi aquifer, we have realized there is a lot of uh, depression. So this concept of managed aquifer recharge using the flood waters will be very uh, of, of great help to the stability of the Nairobi city. Then uh, we have the aspect I mentioned that the, the area that I'm dealing with, the Nairobi city, is vulnerable because it is uh, lying on a flood plain. And then there is inadequate infrastructure for solid waste disposal and stormwater management infrastructure. So we have a uh, presence of regulations and policies that are dealing with flood management, but without specific. Hence, uh, the issue of flood management is not tackled as per 
a specific institution. Then uh, we have the, the managed aquifer for sustainability uh, for Nairobi water. Preliminary studies I've mentioned that we have already done, and that's uh, the ones that are dealing with the issue of uh, uh, carrying out the groundwater assessment. And uh, we all know that uh, geology is key in all the issues of managed aquifer recharge. So the first thing that we have done is to study and to do the mapping of the geology of Nairobi. And we have realized so far that um, the geology has the surface rocks comprising of tertiary volcanic rocks and quaternary alluvium clays and swamp soils. And this was brought about by the intense tect tectonic activities associated with the formation of the Great Rift Valley. And uh, here there was a widespread of uh, eruptions. And uh, it occurred that uh, the, these several layers of uh, uh, geological times, they were deposited. Then underlying there about uh, Agnes, as you summarize. So meters, we have the basement. So I think uh, I'm almost finishing and there I am. So that's Madame. the situation we are in. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Madam Bugwa, for that presentation on what uh, is happening in Kenya, the preparatory work, the studies that have been done. And now basically we want to look at uh, how to integrate the science that has been missing from the perspective of data that basically takes us to the near the face of data science that, that Madam Bugwa has alluded to. And to lead us in this will be Dr. Beth Tellman, who will basically be giving us uh, the progression that have been done where we apply mapping uh, of, of floods using satellite data to help guide flood management. Dr. Beth Tellman, please. Okay, thanks. You gonna sh show my slides? You want me to share my screen? Awesome. Awesome, great. Um, thanks so much for the opportunity to be involved in this discussion today. I think it'll be relevant to uh, what we've heard from other, other panelists and thinking about how we understand and map flood risk, not just modeling it or predicting it, but how we have the opportunity now because of satellites that are circling the globe to see where floods are happening in near real time and also observe patterns that have happened over the past several decades. So I'll just touch a little bit on that technology um, today and give a broad overview of how it can be used in flood management. Next slide, please. Um, so the reason that satellite observation is so important um, is because modeling floods are actually very, very difficult to do. So we've heard other panelists talk about flood models like HECRAS that can be used to build representations of a catchment um, and try to make predictions in a computer about where flood risk is occurring. Um, but a lot of these predictions are hard to make accurate, especially over large portions of the globe. So one study, for example, that compared the six most commonly used global flood models across the subcontinent of Africa found very little agreement in flood prediction. In fact, only 30 to 40% of agreement when you stacked up six flood models together. And you can see here, um, on the left that um, these areas in yellow, this is actually zoom in of a portion of the Nile Basin are where six flood models agree, but huge disagreement areas in red and orange were only one or two models predicted flooding at the same time. Um, you can press the animation. You can click. Yeah, thank you. And then this is an actual flood observed from the Landsat satellite in this same region in blue. And you can see that it really doesn't match the pattern at all from the flood model. And that's because there's been so much infrastructure in the Nile Basin, the elevation data for flood model prediction, 
um, is very poor in this region. And so it can be really difficult to predict where floods will go in a flood model, but very easy to observe them by satellite. And we actually see a very different pattern of where floods are occurring. And so the, the point of this talk um, is to kind of show you why and how this type of satellite observation data is so important to better understand flood risk, especially in regions where we can't model floods very well. Next slide, please. Um, and the way um, that satellites, uh, that flood mapping and satellites work is by taking advantage of the satellite signal. Um, so this is an example on this image here of two satellites um, that are commonly used in flood mapping. These are satellites from the European Space Agency. You can get an image uh, once every three days um, combining these two satellites together. Radar satellites, um, Sentinel-1 is an example of a radar satellite. This is at 10 meter resolution. The signal can actually penetrate clouds, which is really important um, to map water when it's flooding because when, it, when there's floods, there tend to be clouds, especially if they're from rains, monsoons, or cyclone events. You can see these images on the right of a flood that occurred at the same time in the Sentinel-2 satellite that are, blocked by, that are blocked by clouds. And so radar satellites are really important in order to do that mapping. Um, and so many more satellites have been launched in the past several decades that we can now, um, on an almost daily basis, map what's going on in the world at three meter resolution. Um, and you don't even have to download this data onto your local computer. You can actually um, map floods from satellites um, in the cloud um, and process large, large portions of information for free using Google servers. I use Google Earth Engine. You can sign up for free on that, on that platform. Um, this is an example of how flood mapping from satellites uh, work. Um, so you can look at um, a region that's flooding. This is a, a flood recorded by the Dartmouth Flood Observatory, which has a large global database. You can click next. And using Google Earth Engine, you can pull in um, satellite imagery for uh, that location. This is an example using the MODA satellite, uh, which is at 250 meter resolution. You get two images every day from that satellite everywhere in the world. That's a really good option for flood mapping. You can click next. Um, this is what the data from that satellite actually looks like. And you can kind of start to see the areas in blue here um, that indicate where flooding occurred. And you can write a pretty simple algorithm to map water um, on these areas that you can visually see and have the computer indicate where the flood occurred. You can click next. Um, that's what that flood extent actually looks like. Some of these areas are permanent, permanent water, um, but yeah, the areas in blue are where wa surface water was detected during the time of that satellite overpass. And because we get images every day, you can click next, you can see the number of days um, that were inundated um, during, during that event and how long the water tended to stay. Um, and again, this can be done anywhere in the world, um, processed for free using this platform, Google Earth Engine, to analyze um, satellite data. Next. Um, so to end this talk, I just want to give two examples of how this data actually gets used in decision making and in practice. Flood maps from satellites can be used at every phase of the disaster cycle to know where the event happened and to direct aid there. Um, to direct recovery programs long term after the disaster, and to look at the history of flooding to know where floods have happened in the past. Um, other panelists have talked about this, where relocation or more infrastructure might be needed, or um, to price insurance programs to come up with innovative financial ways of dealing with risk. But you have to know the history of flooding in order to do that. Um, next slide. Um, so I'm going to give two examples of flood maps being used for decision making in practice. Um, this one comes from a project that I worked on um, with the Republic of Congo and the World Food Program. Um, we have a, a case study this story written up. I happen to send you if you're, you're interested. The book isn't out yet. Um, but what happened about two years ago in Republic of Congo is 
Uh, there were refugees that moved over the other side of the Congo River, and the World Food Program was concerned if any of the refugee camps were at flood risk and immediately wanted to know, should we move this camp? And we were able to detect um, that floods have happened at least three times in the past 30 years in that location, this area that I circled in, in green, and that that camp should be moved. And they were glad that they made that recommendation because just one year later, um, there were historic, uh, historically high floods in the Republic of Congo, higher there than there had been in 20, in 20 years in that same location. So knowing the history of flooding, taking action to move a refugee camp before the next flood hits can be really, really important for prevention and mitigation. Let me give one more slide here. Next slide. Um, uh, one other example of the use of satellite flood maps for flood management is for insurance. Um, there's a lot of really interesting programs in Bangladesh right now um, to try new ways to manage flood risk. Um, so this uh, Green Delta is a local Bangladesh insurance company. Um, INI actually is the uh, organization that built a satellite flood monitoring system for the insurance company to pay farmers 20% of the insured sum of their crop when 40% of the region is inundated and then pay them 50% of that insured crop when half of the area is inundated. And they do this all by satellite observation. So farmers can get immediate payouts and it allows the insurance company to sell very, very low premiums um, by using satellite systems for um, their insurance program. Okay, one more on the right, if you click. Um, at Columbia and at IRI, we're working with partners in Bangladesh to help them improve and scale these types of insurance programs. So existing programs are mostly based on optical satellites, which I showed previously are hard to map floods well because there's often clouds when there's floods. You can actually see in this example image on the left from MODIS clouds that are blocking some of the water areas. So at Columbia, we've been working with radar satellites um, to develop robust time series of when it floods. Um, so this is an example figure from this project. We can compare the area flooded uh, to water levels from stream gauges in the region and get a sense of of what flooded areas have occurred in almost near real time and build potentially even better and improved insurance programs based on these uh, more accurate radar satellites. And next slide. So as you sum up. Yeah. Second. Okay. <laughs> I just wanted to give people some links. Um, if you're interested in learning more about this on the left, communities that you can join. Um, the Global Re Flood Risk Monitoring Community um, at NASA, the Global Flood Partnership, and access to different data sets that you can download for free, um, and agencies that map floods uh, when hazards occur. Um, so there's a lot of ways to make use of the satellite data and get more involved. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tillman. And um, to just give us a future outlook, uh, you have learned the modeling, the science, the applications, the data mining from satellites, and now the future. What is the future outlook? The emerging climate change scenarios as far as flood management is concerned. And Professor John Mutter from Columbia University will take us through this process. Welcome, Professor John Mutter. Uh, thank you. Um, <coughs> I am going to speak with our slides. Uh, partly in the interest of time, uh, and partly because I, um, I hope I don't need them. Uh, I wanted to talk uh, a little bit about global perspectives and future perspectives. But one thing I wanted to uh, point out uh, is this, the distinction we sometimes make uh, between urban and rural flooding uh, is not necessarily very clear. Um, for instance, uh, I, I know that flooding of the Mississippi River, say in the New Orleans area, is often caused by uh, rain that's occurring somewhere else, uh, up the Mississippi River in the, the rural hinterlands uh, where agriculture is predominant. Uh, when it rains heavily there, uh, the 
the high water uh, propagates down the uh, river, the Mississippi River, and other rivers in, in to New Orleans. So it could be a perfectly clear day in, uh, in New Orleans with not a cloud in sight. And the Mississippi River will uh, just about be overtopping its banks uh, because of rain somewhere else. So I know that urban flooding as a phenomenon uh, can be characterized differently from uh, rural flooding, but there's a connectedness there um, in many instances that uh, we, we can't overlook. Uh, many of the world's most important cities are located on rivers. Uh, you only have to think of, well, New Orleans, New York, London, Paris, and there's a perfectly good reason for it, and that is that in the early days when they were established, um, in the early days when they were established, the, the rivers were a principal source of transportation, uh, bringing uh, rural products uh, to the coast to uh, be shipped for uh, trade, and just to bring uh, whatever products there are down the river, uh, now, the rivers have become less and less uh, a mean, the primary means of transporting materials. Um, but that's why they are where they are. You just have to think anywhere around the world, the big cities, the important cities, are on rivers um, for social economic reasons uh, without a great deal of thought about the hydrology of the reason, uh, <laughs> particularly uh, New Orleans. Um, so that was just a point I wanted to make. Um, the only good thing about flooding in rural areas is that um, it, it typically does recharge aquifers in, in a region where uh, groundwater aquifers are important for agriculture and perhaps even drinking water. Uh, the seasonal rains will recharge aquifers, uh, which is the only good thing. Um, uh, sometimes the the year that follows a flooding year will see increased uh, crop production because of the greater availability of groundwater. Um, of course, you don't have to have a flood to recharge aquifers, but uh, a lot of rain is a good thing. I also wanted to mention that um, in a global perspective, looking at all disasters everywhere over the last 30 to 40 years, uh, floods are number one in sense of occurrence. There's more flood disasters in the world than any other sort of disaster. Um, they are not the leading cause of death. Uh, they are not the leading cause of displacement and they're not the leading cause of uh, economic disruption. And what I'm talking about is a global perspective. Of course, in a country like Kenya, where earthquakes, by the way, earthquakes are what causes the greatest uh, mortality of all the natural disasters. And of course, Kenya being not very prone to earthquakes, happily, uh, other forms of disasters take precedent. And in Kenya, of course, uh, flooding in particular years can be uh, the leading source of economic damage, the leading source of displacement, uh, the leading, leading source of, of, of death. But on a global perspective, that's, that's not the case. Um, uh, so uh, when we think of, uh, in terms of you know, what's gonna happen with flooding, we need to understand that, uh, well, first there's two forms of flooding. Uh, one is that caused by storm surge uh, from cyclones or hurricanes or typhoons, uh, whichever terminology you prefer to use. And that is um, seawater flooding. And seawater flooding can be very devastating if it if it encompasses an area where crops are being grown, it can, it can ruin the soil, uh, and in an almost irreparable way. Uh, what we've been talking about 
uh, this morning, or this morning to me, has dominantly been uh, freshwater flooding associated with uh, excessive rains, either monsoon rains or uh, the rainy seasons caused in places where there is the influence of the so-called intertropical convergence zone, which gives the um, rainy season, dry season cyclicity that you see in a number of places. Interestingly enough, um, in terms of <coughs> uh, mortality, um, we are seeing <coughs> fewer deaths from seawater flooding and an increased number of deaths in freshwater flooding. And that, it turns out, is because we're getting better at predicting the landfall of cyclones and we're getting better at evacuating. So the predominant uh, mortality in Hurricane Sandy, for instance, turned out to be freshwater flooding, uh, flash flooding inland from the coastal regions where uh, the hurricane made landfall because we're so good at predicting these days and we're so good at evacuating uh, almost everywhere. So freshwater flooding has become more of a, a danger uh, than uh, seawater flood. Um, in terms of the, the future, um, we know in a fairly robust way and with some observational backup that hurricanes of the future uh, will come with more intense rainfall. Uh, the, the reason is fairly straightforward. Uh, uh, hurricanes need warm water. They need a lot of other conditions uh, to form as well, but they need warm water. And, and the warmer the world is, the warmer the water will be. Hence, there will be more evaporation of water off the ocean which is where hurricanes typically form. And that means there'll be more moisture in the air. Um, uh, the latent heat of condensation fuels hurricanes, uh, as well as the uh, surface water. Uh, and the expectation is for stronger rainfall uh, in the future. And I mean, obviously, freshwater rain. Um, uh, we think that uh, Hurricane Harvey in uh, Houston was an example of a sort of a new world hurricane uh, in that the rainfall was uh, biblical uh, and Houston flooded uh, tremendously, far more damage than wind damage or storm surge. It was freshwater flooding from the intensified hurricane. Uh, it also stalled over Houston, uh, which is a phenomenon we're now seeing in current hurricanes that didn't seem to be as uh, as common in earlier hurricanes. Um, so what we are going to see in hurricanes of the future, uh, just to sum up here, uh, and rainfall in the future, um, we should see a fewer total number of hurricanes, cyclones, whatever you wish to describe them. But of the fewer number, more will be really intense and really intense in terms of wind speed, but mostly in terms of the amount of rain that will fall. Now that is also true uh, for the, the wet seasons where the intertropical convergence zone sits over places like Kenya. Rain in the future will be more intense, last longer, and uh, cause more flooding unless we manage the systems a little bit better. So although there are regional differences, there is a, uh, a, a, a general prediction that a warmer world will be a wetter world because of more evaporation of the ocean, a warmer atmosphere holds more moisture. There will be more moisture for it to hold. When it can't hold it anymore, it rains and there will be flooding. 
Thank they're you. the sort of remarks I wanted to make. I can contribute to other forms of the discussion, uh, <clears throat> but that was my message. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor John Muta, for giving us that outlook and it tells us, Agnes, you have work uh, packaged for you. Expect more rainfall, more rainfall events, more floods. Uh, and now to take us, we go to the next uh, uh, session, and we appreciate all our panelists, uh, led by Professor John Muta, um, Sushmita Segupta, Professor Elizabeth Tellman, uh, Agnes Mbugwa, and Dr. Obiero. Thank you very much for the presentation. And now we have questions that have been put in the Q&A session. Those questions, you can post them on the Q&A chat uh, point that you have at the bottom of your screen. And so far we have 12 questions that uh, we are going to just go through very fast and direct them to the relevant panelists to answer them. So leading in this, uh, it's a question from Clavis uh, Wara and he's asking, and I think this should be going to uh, Dr. Biero, whether there's any um, successful application of flood forecast models for early warning action or no regret actions in the regions. And basically his focus in the previous question was on the ASAL and the semi-arid areas. Uh, Dr. Biero, you can take that together with the, the question from Dr. Fatuma Daoud, which is asking about flood frequency and impacts that are increasing over the years. Um, what should be the main strategy and approach to mitigate this? So you can answer that partially from the forecasting perspective, and then Agnes will come in to answer it from the practical implementation perspective. Obiero in one minute or two. Yeah, okay, uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, well, in the region, the action to floods has been more or less like uh, immediate and actions are usually taken when flood is occurring, as I had mentioned in my earlier presentation. So, there may be few, if any, instances where uh, flood forecasts, especially based on hydrologic modeling, have been utilized. Probably this could be due to uh, probably research not probably being integrated in terms of uh, uh, policy making with regard to flood management, and this like that. But in Kenya, I think. Uh, there has been some element of uh, use of forecasts in the management of, uh, of uh, floods, but these probably have been just short-term forecasts based on rainfall predictions because we tend to associate rainfall with, uh, with floods, yeah? but not taking into account other factors actually in the catchment. So, there is in Kenya, I think, instances where I think the Red Cross and other NGOs have relied on forecast uh, predictions, mainly based on rainfall, to try and see how they can assist communities to mitigate against significant impact of the floods. But with regard to hydrological uh, modeling, I think much has been focused more on generating the information, but this information has not been quite integrated in the actions that are taken to mitigate against the floods. That's why we find ourselves uh, taking actions, usually when the flood is occurring or when it has occurred, and then we try to see what we can do. That basically is my take on it. Um, thank you, uh, Dr. Obiero, for the work that you have been able to, to explain. Uh, to add to that, uh, when it comes to implementation, I will uh, add on two perspectives. One, 
uh, the issue of the institutions that are already in place. We have the several institutions that are dealing with the forecast in the country, that is in Kenya. And we have the meteorological department that is uh, handling, that has the mandate to handle the forecast. And we also have another institution that is called Water Resources Authority, that is the one that is monitoring on the levels of, uh, of the river waters, the lakes, and also the dams, and other institutions that are in place. Then we have uh, another institution that is uh, quite new, that is the National Water Storage and Harvesting Authority, that is uh, given the mandate of uh, harvesting the, the, the waters, the flood waters, and also the rainfall waters, and also for the flood controls. So we have all those institutions in place, but um, the bit that is very undoing is the issue of uh, disconnect, that uh, this uh, institution that is, um, has got this mandate, uh, sharing of the information and the data so that we have a flow of the implementation, that is where the disconnect is coming in. And uh, then we have the implementation because um, like the, the center where I'm coming from, we need now to connect with the, those institutions, some are regulatory bodies, and us now we come in as implementer. And as the question goes, uh, occurring in the semi-arid areas, we of course know the, here the issue of the vegetation cover is uh, very minimal. And also the soils, the geology of the area for infiltration is also wanting and it is quite poor because it is dominated by clays. So we need now the, the issue of uh, coming together and adding synergies so that we are able to implement uh, the issues that are there. So having said that, uh, let me uh, commend the panelists that uh, that we are joining now with academia in the in this area of uh, controlling floods another implementation uh, aspect that needs to be dealt with uh, for both from the policy the implementer and also the research institute especially the academia so that is the way to go and we need such framework where we are able to work all of us thank you Thank you very much. Uh, maybe the last two questions that can uh, take us through this is to both Telman and uh, Professor Muta. Starting with Telman, uh, I think uh, somebody is asking about the availability of DEM data in resolutions that can be applied for purposes of flood mapping. How available are they? And then uh, it's also asking the simple thresholding approach work in mapping flooded areas. What should be kept in mind while using these approaches? So Dr. Uh, Professor Telman will answer that. And then somebody was asking how far is the future? This futuristic planning, he was directing the question to Biero, but I think uh, Professor Muta, since you are giving us a futuristic approach, uh, how far is this future we are talking about and what are these predictions? When do we expect these uh, increased floods to come from the rainfall, especially for us here in Kenya? So we start with Professor Elizabeth Telman and then John Muta to close up that round of questions. Um, okay, on the DEM on digital elevation model availability, there are global um, global elevation data available at 30 meter resolution now um, from the SRTM satellite, the shuttle topography mission from NASA. So you can download that anywhere in the world. Um, the quality of that data varies greatly. So there are still a lot of issues in the vertical accuracy. It can be 
off by five to seven meters in some locations. And so it's still really difficult if you're doing flood, if you're building a flood model in a really flat watershed where there's not a lot of topography variation near the ocean, public data is, public satellite data often will not capture that well. And it's better to build your own digital elevation model if you can um, using um, two different images. If you can triangulate and get an uh, elevation estimate, you can use aster data. The most expensive option and the best elevation data will always be to fly LIDAR planes, but that can cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. So there's different options from kind of free DEMs, which may not be accurate enough, to ones you can maybe make yourself, to ones that you can pay for. Um, the second question, uh, but making better DEMs is a really big problem for flood modeling um, and, a, and a major need, honestly, right now. Um, the second question was about, and I think I answered some of it in the chat, was about thresholding on, on radar and Sentinel-1 satellites. Usually water is more sensitive to um, co-polarization, so VV or just HH. Um, the water signal is gonna change a lot uh, when water um, floods, when water appears over an area and you'll be able to see the decrease in backscatter in that signal very clearly. The one problem is that actually vegetated areas don't decrease in backscatter. They sometimes increase a little bit in backscatter because you'll get a bouncing signal from water to vegetation. So in wetlands or flooded fields, you may need to use another, another radar band, a cross polarization band, so V, VH or HV, to make sure that the backscatter decreases in another band um, to, to prevent um, loss of loss of flooded area and flooded vegetated areas. So you need both cross polarization and co-polarization to do a good job of flood mapping. How far is the future? <laughs> unmute your mic, sir. Professor John, unmute your mic. You are talking, we are not hearing you. Kindly unmute your okay. mic. Okay, uh, that's probably better. Um, the, the answer is we're starting to see the future now. Uh, what we expect to see, for instance, of hurricanes in the future is more intense rain. Well, that's exactly what happened with Hurricane Harvey in Houston. But still today, the average hurricane has an average amount of rain. And every now and then we're seeing hurricanes that look like what is predicted for the future. What we're expecting is that as time passes, there'll be more and more harvests. Harvests will not be uncommon. They'll become more common. And I, you know, there's, there's a lot of predictions out there, but you know, we, by the time we're certainly into the 2050s, we, we should expect more Hurricane Harveys uh, all, all the time. And this is true for any of the elements of the hydrological cycle. Uh, you know, like the, the flooding that we've just been talked about uh, in India and uh, Kenya look like future predictions. And they're happening already. They're just not happening yearly. They're still relatively rare, but as time passes, they'll become more and more common. And by the mid-century, it will be the, the common form of, of rainfall. So what Prop is saying that we now need more sands in our region, better predictive tools, better mapping. So Agnes, I hope you are taking the notes. We're in charge of education, <laughs> training, and research. So. USA has managed to deal with hurricanes which look a bit more severe because they have better prediction. We are dealing with rainfall, which doesn't look very severe, but it seems to be managing us. So we need to put our acts together. And somebody is asking you, and Lois Mutua is saying that groundwater recharge has a huge depends as a huge depends on the dependency on water quality. And he's saying that there's high pollution levels in Nairobi. 
how will you handle the pollution dilemma in doing groundwater recharge? And then somebody is also asking, uh, what is the government doing concerning flooding areas like Rukana, apart from policies which are never implemented? I think that's a, a clincher, but uh, the answer them <laughs> as best as you can. Then when you are through with that, I think uh, Lois is also asking about managing the floods, um, building, uh, whether you can handle that from the building codes area so that we deal with rainwater harvesting from a building perspective. Um, I think all those questions are directed to Agnes because they are policy oriented. Then there is a question there that I think we'll use to close up. And this was a technical question that's directed to Telman and I is dealing with the, the kind of uh, bands that are available that are used for purposes of flood mapping. I'm trying to get the question, I'm not getting it. But for any question that we're not handling, I'm asking the panelists, you can also answer live uh, by typing in to the questions that I've not flagged off. Agnes, pollution management to deal with flood water, groundwater recharge issues. The pollution aspect, um, uh, we, we have uh, also checked on that. Thank you for that issue. And um, let me comment that uh, in the kind of uh, structures that we are putting in place, especially for Nairobi, we are dealing it uh, with a different perspective. One, it is from the catchment. We have already identified the the recharge areas right from the Gong Hills and other uh, subcatchments that we will be dealing with. So that aspect of uh, recharging the groundwater from the catchment area, it is quite different from the water harvesting in the Nairobi city and also doing the artificial gradual recharge. So we are dealing with the uh, with the aspect of artificial groundwater recharge using several several activities. One is from the catchment area, where we can um, we can uh, we can uh, do several structures, and uh, from that aspect, and also we can use the agricultural approaches. Um, then there is the one of harvesting the the floods, especially in the city, and then uh, treating the water and then injecting using the injection wells. So we have several approaches that is from the catchment and then the other one. The other one is on the uh, management of the wastewater, which also needs a lot of treatment. And then uh, we can also talk of uh, inject, injection wells. So that is the perspective that we are using. Again, there is a question on the Trucana, in the policies that have not been uh, implemented. You realize that I'm coming from the policy background also, and I'm a hydrogeologist by profession. Well, profession. Uh, the policy issue, we might have the policies in place, but I've talked about the disconnect. The disconnect here is that you have the policy in place, but it has not been cascaded down to strategies of implementation. And then the, that, strategies of implementation has to go hard in hard with the budget implication. So if you get inadequate budget or funding, so implementation of a policy, you can uh, uh, agree with me, it is also a challenge. Uh, I don't know whether there is another, another one that yeah, I've there's not one on building codes. Uh, there's one on building codes, but I want to uh... Shushmita to also help because I know CSC has done a lot on uh, issues of groundwater recharge also in, in India. She mm -hmm. can also share experiences. This is something they've done for long in Chennai, in, in yeah. New Delhi, and particularly on how you are able to use laws to basically help incentivize and drive the rainwater perspective, especially from the building area. How are you integrating the need to do rainwater and the laws that exist? And then also answer how have you um, dealt with the pollution 
when we are doing groundwater, artificial groundwater reaches, to see the experiences that we have from India. Okay. So CAC has been working uh, on this rainwater harvesting for more than two decades, and we are the ones who have spearheaded uh, the campaign in the capital city of Delhi. So for groundwater recharge, I saw a question uh, which says about how to handle the pollution levels. So uh, there, are two, there, there are two main types of uh, pollution levels. One is um, the chemical part and another one is the bacteriological part. So if it's a contaminated with the chemical part, so you can have rainwater harvesting, uh, groundwater recharge, which will improve your contamination uh, contamination levels and um, but if it is a bacteriological contamination or high nitrate contamination is there then we actually need to see our uh, toilets actually whether it's technologically sound or not so it's basically due to wrong toilet designs this pollution load of bacteriological contamination or high nitrate values uh, actually uh, occur in the groundwater now on the incentive thing uh, um, yeah, uh, we actually, we have both carrot and stick uh, should be there. Uh, we have actually uh, launched the, uh, our country has launched many incentive uh, incentives, like they give rebates to your uh, house taxes, they give, give rebates to your water bills. Uh, so we have several uh, types of incentives which actually motivate people uh, to go for rainwater harvesting. But uh, these are at building levels, and we need to have uh, a preservation of water bodies, uh, which will help, which are big sponges in the cities, which will not only recharge the groundwater but also arrest the floods in the cities. So thank, thank you, Sushmita. Then we go back to Elizabeth. Somebody was talking about the bands that you use for flood water management. Uh, but that's basically the satellite imagery data, I think. Yeah, I think I maybe answered that question previously and I did it extensively in the chat. I can go over it again if you want, but. You answered the question to the person. Can you also help the other audience to hear? Oh, um, sure. Um, um, so the, the question in the chat was specifically with the Sentinel-1 radar satellite, what are the right bands to use and what are the most sensitive bands to mapping flood water? Um, what I was explaining earlier is that um, the VV band is usually what I use in Sentinel-1. You'll see a big decrease in signal once water uh, uh, enters land. Um, so you can usually use a decrease in that signal by how much it drops to map where floods occur, um, except for flooded vegetation where you might see an increase in signal. And in those cases, you'll need to use another band, the VH band, to make sure the signal is dropping for flooded vegetation as well. So both the VH and the VV band uh, measure how much the signal is dropping. To set what threshold that should be needs to be done for that specific region. So you can look at what is the mean signal over time to know what, what is the variance. And then any time that the signal drops below maybe two standard deviations outside of the mean, see if that's a good, a good way to map floods and always vet that against some local historic event in the region maybe looking for other optical satellite imagery so you can test out your threshold if it produced a good flood map. You can even just look visually um, and make sure that you get a good result. Don't just blindly go making maps and setting thresholds. It's really easy to make a bad flood map, but it's hard to make a good one. So take the time to compare your map to other satellite data or to local people in the region who know and have experienced where it's flooded. Satellites aren't always right. <laughs> People know where Thank floods have happened. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, our dear panelists. I think I'll now take it back to Murugi and uh, Mudoni to give us, uh, Pauline, to give us um, a way forward from this uh, discourse. Are we going to have more interactions or is it a one-off event? 
It has been a very nice time listening to our panel panelists. Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, in such a system, we can't give them a round of applause. But you can just say thank you very much. Uh, Pauline, take yes. it from there. Thank you so much to our esteemed panelists, Professor John Muta, Professor Elizabeth Tellman, Susmita Segupta, Dr. John Obiero, uh, Ms. Agnes Bogwa, and our moderator, Mr. Johannes Orodi. We are very glad that you took time to come in and educate the public, uh, both uh, you know, in our region and in India as well. Um, so we want to also thank our collaborators, the University of Nairobi, Columbia University, uh, Center for Science and Environment, India, uh, Columbia Global Centers, Mumbai, of course, thank you for coming together to put, to put this great presentation together. We thank you and we wish you a great evening. Bye. <laughs>